Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Gonshaitan. For those who are visiting us for the first time, uh, welcome to our public health seminar series. Typically, we meet over at the Kalai at the uh, McDonnell Douglas Auditorium. So I was standing out there making sure those who are lost uh, will see me and come here. But uh, this is such a nice space that we wish we could use it every time. But it's expensive, and. Um, uh, we will use it uh, for very special guests, such as the one we have today. And uh, actually, his, his uh, background and training and expertise fits very well with the Kalaiti um, 2 uh, program. This was, uh, for those who don't know what Kalaiti 2 stands for, C California Institute for Telecommunications, and there's another T involved there. Um, but this was a, a uh, legislature-sponsored initiative approved by the people of California uh, to build the world-class uh, telecommunications program uh, in the age of the internet. And um, many universities competed for that program. and. Um, UC Irvine and UC San Diego collaborate. And this building uh, was made possible by the funds uh, that the people of California put to that effort. It has allowed uh, the university to build all kinds of expertise. Uh, the sponsor on the graduate programs, uh, graduate research opportunities that are interdisciplinary. I think somewhere upstairs there is a hyper wall where uh, large-scale modeling uh, occurs. So they model things like uh, global climate change and uh, infectious diseases. Uh, a lot of work that Kalaiti to sponsors is um, pertinent to, to health. So today's uh, speaker, um, many of our faculty members through their network identify to us people who work in areas of, of uh, interest, cutting edge in their field, uh, and of relevance to faculty across uh, our campus. Uh, today's speaker was nominated by uh, Professor Suzanne Huang. Uh, she couldn't be here with us today, otherwise she would be standing here introducing uh, Dr. Bruce Lee. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to stand in Suzanne's place to, to do this honor. Uh, Dr. Lee is currently an associate professor of medicine and biomedical informatics at the University of Pittsburgh. And he's a core faculty of the Rand University of Pittsburgh Health Institute. Um, I asked him how his flight was, and he said he just came down from Seattle because he has a long um, interaction with the Gates Foundation there. So he's uh, all over uh, the country in collaborations and establishing uh, programs that are of interest, as he did with the public health and infectious diseases co computational and operational operations research called FICO uh, group at the University of Pittsburgh. And this is a very, very interdisciplinary group they design economic and operational computer models that help decision makers tackle infectious diseases of global importance. He is the scientific lead for the Hamas project and the REA project, and his current funding comes from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the NIH, CDC, National Science Foundation, and the National Library of Medicine. Uh, he's a very prolific uh, researcher, uh, he got his bachelor's at Harvard and also his MD uh, at Harvard. And then he added the uh, master's in business administration from Stanford Graduate School of Business. This is essentially, uh, he embodies the kind of interdisciplinary work that we hope will lead to solutions to all the global health problems that we teach in classes and we try to do research on. So please join me to welcome Dr. Bruce Lee to UC Irvine. Thank you, Dilly, for uh, inviting me, and uh, thank you, all of you, for um, attending the seminar. So I want to uh, try to make this as interactive as possible, so I encourage questions throughout the uh, talk. I'm happy to take the talk 
through different directions, or if you want to ask me ask questions or have a discussion at the end, that's fine as well. So I'll be talking about virtual uh, global health, uh, computational modeling and simulation. So how modeling and simulation can be applied to different types of global health questions um, and decisions. And when I say global health, that also includes domestic um, issues as well. So I'm going to run through uh, a quick what is modeling, um, and then uh, look at how modeling may be applied to different areas of global health, such as vaccine development, vaccine delivery, vaccine administration, and other areas uh, besides vaccines, because there are interventions besides vaccines. And then we, we can uh, save the last part for a summary or discussion, and we can go back to any of the issues or questions that may be lingering after going through these. So the first question is, what is modeling? So when I tell people that I'm a modeler, they look at my clothing and my general choice of clothing, and they said, ah, I'm not so sure about that. So when I'm talking about modeling, I'm not talking about this type of modeling. Uh, I'm talking about more about computer modeling and using computers and mathematical equations to represent different questions and issues. So essentially, modeling and simulation is taking any type of situation, process, system, or decision, and creating a mathematical or computer representation of that. So to ask people, so when is the last time you modeled? So, me, Diane, we can uh, ask you, when is the last time you modeled? And not, not the previous type of modeling, but. I'm looking at your decolonization model, but I personally have not done any of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about yourself over there? When's the last time you modeled? Friday. <laughs> Friday. <laughs> this past Friday? Yeah. Okay. I do uh, some time series modeling and forecasting of, of uh, kind of seasonal components of, um, of uh, mental disorder. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, what about yourself? When's the last time you modeled? Yep. Mm -hmm. Maybe a year ago. A year ago. Okay. Can you give me an approximate month? Um, April. April. Okay. So all of you are wrong. So in fact, you just modeled right here and now. So when you considered the, my question and you considered different possible answers, you were actually modeling that in your head. So you sat there and said, okay, he's asking me a question. Should I look away? Should I try to ignore it? Okay, maybe, maybe like he's still looking at me, so I need to do, do something about this. So what are my different possibilities? You know, I can continue to be silent. I can answer. So then you looked at that outcome. So you said, if I continue to be silent, well, maybe he'll go away. Um, but that, what's the probability of that? Because, you know, this is being filmed, et cetera. And you said, okay, how should I answer? Well, you answered April, I think, or last year. Yeah. And then you answered on Friday. And then you, 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 you're, in your mind, you basically model the different possibilities. If I answer Friday, what might happen? And so forth. So a sense, in essence, we're modeling constantly. So every single decision, every type of action, you actually, it's a, a result or a summary of many micro models that are running in your head. I mean, you basically, many times you do things by instinct, but in, in, in essence, that's a collection of models that's constantly going on in your head and making these decisions. So, Modeling is essentially, everyone models every day. So modeling is essentially taking that process that's going on in people's heads and putting it on a table um, so that everyone can see either a table or a computer or on a set of uh, papers with um, mathematical equations so that we can see not only what other people are thinking or how other people are representing a system, but how you yourself are representing a system or a decision. Because many times you make decisions throughout the day and you don't really think about it. You don't realize what inputs and what measures and what intermediate relationships go into that making that decision. So when you actually put, try to construct a model to try to determine what your thinking process is doing, many times it can be surprising. Many times you make a decision based on faulty information or relationships that you think are present but may not be present or maybe you're missing major relationships that should impact the decision that you're making. So computer simulation modeling is widely used in many different areas. So air and space travel and exploration is one example. So they won't send up a rocket or a space shuttle um, until hours and hours or days of, of modeling and simulation are performed. Transportation, natural resource and energy exploration. Um, this, is, this has become a bad example over the past several years, but finance and investment, um, military and defense, and sports as well. So sports is actually one of the uh, 
newer areas where modeling simulation is used. So for instance, the New England Patriots use models, computer models and simulations to, thank you, um, to better, better understand or anticipate what uh, opposing defenses and offenses might, might uh, uh, put together um, for the next game. Uh, the Houston Rockets use modeling and simulation to help this, uh, determine the appropriate draft picks. So by comparison, medicine and public health ha have actually lagged many other fields in, in terms of using modeling and simulation. Now we're trying to change that over the past decade, but previously uh, there had been, had been more of a disconnect between uh, these potentially powerful uh, methodologies and, and public health and medicine. Now that's changing. And in many ways, uh, public health is ideal for modeling simulation because, first of all, it uses a number of different, uh, there are a number of different factors uh, that go into decision making public health. Uh, it crosses disciplines. Uh, decision making and the results can be very complex. So you can make a decision and have, can have percolating effects that you don't anticipate. And of course, the outcomes are extremely important. So you can't afford to make mistakes in public, in, in public health. Say you, you unleash a program um, in a particular area that takes a lot of time, effort, consumes a lot of resources, and many times the results aren't seen until several years after the decision has been made, and sometimes too late to, to, uh, to change that decision. So I want to emphasize that modeling is not a replacement for other types of methodologies. It can serve as a complement. So you have retrospective studies, prospective studies, you don't necessarily create a model or a simulation to replace or in place of a perspective or retrospective study, but you can help, modeling can help guide uh, the design of these types of studies and also help complement these studies so that you can overcome some of these limitations. So we all know that uh, retrospective studies can be very powerful, and same with uh, prospective studies, but they do have some limitations such as data availability. And let's see how we. Work this, this one. Okay, here we go. Such so as data availability, so you may not have the right data um, available to answer the question. Generalizability, so say you collect data in a certain location, so say you collect uh, the data in Thailand, is that ap applicable to uh, Africa or the US or even other parts of um, Thailand or other parts of Southeast Asia? And granularity, many times the, res the data that you have doesn't go down to the level that you're actually interested in, so you might have uh, data that's that's uh, um, collected for an entire country, but you may not know, um, you don't, may not have data for specific towns or specific cities. Similarly, prospective studies, you have same issues with generalizability. Study population, so say you conduct a prospective study on a, uh, for a particular population, does it apply to other populations? Or does it even apply to that population uh, after several years, because populations change over time? It can be very expensive. And there can be ethical and legal issues. So say you want to study the transmission of a certain virus uh, in a location. Well, if you wrote a uh, study where you're going to release that virus and see what happens, that most likely is not going to pass any IRB. So modeling can serve as this bridge uh, amongst these different uh, methodologies. So it can help translate an idea or need into designing a retrospective study or a prospective study. It can, have, uh, it can serve as a bridge between these two, and it can also serve a bridge uh, between translating the results of these studies to different policies and practice. So one use of modeling and simulation is to identify priorities in terms of studies and data collection. So if you, if you create a model and simulation to determine what might be different if you know the value of a certain parameter or a certain type of data much better, and it can show you the value of that information. So let's go through some examples of um, modeling and simulation use, uh, being used for vaccine development, for instance. So this, I just wanted to point out, this is uh, uh, the FICOR team. Uh, the coordinator is Sarah Barsh. Um, uh, uh, Chris Bacon coordinates our um, tropical, neglected tropical diseases modeling efforts. And uh, a number of these other members I'll, I'll point out because there's a lot of other teams that we work with or, or that, um, that are involved in, in our modeling efforts. So for the development of different interventions such as vaccines, we, we often merge economic and operational modeling with epidemiological modeling. So for instance, we can help try to determine the burden landscape and do segmentation and analyses to help characterize a problem 
and help target interventions and intervention development. I'll give you an example the next slide of that. Uh, we can also uh, assess different types of interventions, such as the cost benefit, cost effectiveness, budget impact, and return on investment. Uh, if you, for instance, want to, to uh, determine where should you invest funds to, uh, to develop an, uh, an intervention. Uh, so it can help prioritize in investment, prioritize development, and prioritize data collection. As I mentioned, it can help direct you know, where are the uh, high impact areas to, to, to uh, direct data collection. It can guide the development, investment, and implementation of these interventions. It can help establish target pro profiles for different interventions. How many of you are familiar with target product profiles? Have you heard of the term? So uh, TPPs, which is short for target pro profiles, essentially are menus or wi uh, wish lists uh, for an intervention or a measure. So say you want to develop some type of vaccine so for um, a certain type of, uh, uh, to prevent a certain type of disease. What should be the efficacy, target efficacy for that vaccine? What should be the target population? What should be the duration of action? There's all these different parameters that you need, that ideally you want to establish before you actually develop the intervention. Um, so for instance, uh, this is an example of a study that we published in um, Lancet Infectious Diseases where we looked at the uh, economic burden of Chagas disease. And Chagas disease, as you may, may know, is a um, disease that affects uh, Latin America quite substantially. Um, and essentially it can lead to, uh, ultimately the parasite is uh, transmitted um, by insect vector and then it can ultimately lead to all types of uh, cardiac complications. So it can lead to cardiomyopathy or congestive heart failure. But it hasn't been well characterized in terms of its impact, uh, its global impact. So in this study, we essentially profiled what's the, uh, what are the potential healthcare costs, what are the DALIs, um, DALI stands for Disability Adjusted Life Years uh, effect, and what are the productivity effects of Chagas disease. And we looked at different countries and different regions, Latin America, North America, Europe, Australia, and total. So we essentially built a simulation model where a, if a single person got infected with uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, which is the uh, parasite that causes Chagas disease, then what would happen to that person? So we created this outcomes model where people, we would feed uh, infected individuals into this model, and then they would, they would progress as uh, patients as simulated patients would progress. So many of them would remain asymptomatic for a number of different years, and then eventually progress either to mild heart disease or major heart disease, or some would not survive. So essentially it's a simulation model of what would happen. So we, went, we, we sent thousands or millions of infected individuals through this just to basically simulate uh, patients in, in Latin America, North America, Europe, and all these different regions. And then we generated costs. So for instance, if someone uh, had to, if a simulated patient had to go to the emergency room or go to the hospital uh, to get treatment, then that would be associated with certain costs. So if, if a simulated patient had to get an echocardiogram, then we would uh, attach that cost, the cost of our echocardiogram to that. And we generate each of these different results. So the, uh, the, the main punchline with this is that the, the overall cost and overall burden is quite substantial globally. Um, and then also we found that uh, healthcare, while healthcare costs were one component, uh, productivity losses also contribute substantially. So many of these individuals who develop Chagas disease, uh, so essentially it's a chronic disease. So they have chronic heart failure and over a number of years, their productivity or their ability to contribute to the workforce uh, steadily declines. And that is a tremendous burden on the locations or the countries uh, where this is happening. And we also found that the burden in North America is not, uh, not insignificant. So we have a, a reasonable burden in North America as well as Europe. And this is traditionally thought of more as a Latin American disease. So all of these findings just that number one, that this is a substantial health problem and it's comparable in, in, to uh, many cancers and many uh, diarrheal diseases that get much more, much more attention. And it's also a problem that's not necessarily regional. It's affecting other parts of the world and it's growing as well. Uh, and then the final take home point was that these, these substantial productivity losses uh, should be noteworthy to businesses because they're essentially affecting the economy. So there's many situations where 
you have these diseases that are affecting the healthcare system, but they're also affecting the general economy, uh, which ultimately may, may motivate businesses to pay more attention to this. this uh, uh, an example of this occurring was HIV. So HIV, is, as you know, causes substantial burden throughout the world. But it wasn't until it was demonstrated that it actually causes productivity losses that many businesses were willing to start supporting um, uh, drug regimen or treatment for people who are infected with HIV. Because ultimately, businesses realize once something's affecting their bottom line, that it may be a worthwhile investment to start trying to prevent or control, uh, control the problem. I, I assume you <laughs> use different costs for different regions for this line. Yes. The US number is very small compared Yes. So what we did, uh, excellent question. So for each country, we pull the, uh, uh, in the different income numbers. We pull the healthcare costs. We also change the type of regimens or treatments that they receive based on the uh, specific country or specific region. OK. Um, so then once you outline the burden and try to segment what the burden is like, and, and by segment I mean identify which regions or which sectors are bearing uh, different proportions of the burden, uh, one of the next steps might be to start developing uh, a plan or a menu for an intervention for that disease. So this is an example of uh, visceral leishmaniasis, which is a substantial problem in uh, different parts of the world, in, in particular uh, India. And uh, currently, there are some interventions out there, such as treatment um, and some general en environmental interventions, but there's no vaccine. So we wanted to determine if we were to develop a vaccine for visceral leishmaniasis, what should it look like? And there are currently certain, several candidates in, under development. So we wanted to not only uh, guide future development of uh, technologies, but also guide the current development of uh, leishmaniasis vaccine. So similar to Chagas disease, we develop a disease model, a simulation model in which uh, individuals could cycle through these different states. Uh, so, so an individual could either get a vaccine or no vaccine, and then that individual would remain uh, well but susceptible uh, to infection for a number of years. And at some point, that person might get infected and travel through these different states. I won't go through these in detail, but after talk, be happy to, to go back and, and, and uh, walk through the model. Uh, in greater detail. But essentially, we sent patients through this model, uh, and half of them get vaccinated, and half of them did not, and then, and then measured the different uh, uh, outcomes of what, would, what might happen. And then we determined the incremental cost effectiveness of uh, a uh, uh, vaccine for visceral leishmaniasis. And we ranged a number of different values, such as the vaccine cost or the vaccine efficacy. So each of these lines represent uh, different uh, vaccines of different efficacy. Uh, this horizontal line is the vaccine cost or cost of vaccination, and this is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Now, are, are all of you, are any of you familiar with ICERs or incremental cost effectiveness ratios? Some. Okay, so I can quickly summarize. So essentially, it is the difference in, in the, uh, the numerator is the difference in cost between two different situations. So what, you might have the difference in cost between having a vaccine versus not having a vaccine. And the denominator is the difference in health effects. So, uh, and in this case, we're measuring health effects in terms of dollies, disability adjusted life years. So disability adjusted life years taking into account uh, not only the years, lost, uh, years of life lost, but also the years lost to disability. So for instance, if you are, um, if you're not, functioning 100%, so if you're either uh, disabled, uh, you're, you're not feeling as well, you're not gonna be as productive. Your, your life is not gonna be as um, uh, productive as if you were in, in perfect health. So what we did was essentially measure the difference in cost between uh, people who received the vaccine and people who did not receive the vaccine and the difference in dollies between people who received the vaccine and did not receive the vaccine. And then by WHO, or World Health Organization criteria, if the ICER is less than three times the GTP per capita for that country, then the intervention is considered cost effective. And if it's less than one times the GDP per capita for that country, it's considered high, highly cost effective. 
So these are different thresholds for something being considered cost effective and highly cost effective. Is that, is that clear to everyone? I'd be happy to uh, go through examples if needed. But so essentially what we did was we, tried, we measured the ICER for different scenarios or different vaccination costs, different vaccine efficacy, and we, we, we ranged the variables of all different vaccine parameters such as duration of action, uh, number of doses, and we found that there are many situations in which the vaccine was cost effective and in many cases highly cost effective. So here you can see that as long as it remains below this dotted line, it's highly cost effective and below this dashed line, it's cost effective. Not surprisingly, the vaccine efficacy had a uh, substantial uh, impact on the uh, cost effectiveness uh, of the vaccine but we still were able to find situations where even a 25% efficacious vaccine is cost effective or even highly cost effective. So that suggests the vaccine doesn't necessarily have to be perfect to be valuable. Um, so we also did something similar to develop a, a, a model for the um, Saga's disease vaccine. And again, these are the details. This is the schematic for the model. Um, Essentially, people would walk through these different uh, states, and these are different probability notes. Uh, again, I'd be happy to go through this in detail after the talk. And we found with the Chagas disease vaccine that the vac vaccination is cost effective when it, it costs up to $200, as long as its efficacy is greater than 75%. And if the effic vaccine efficacy is greater than 75% and vaccine cost was $20, vaccinating, uh, vaccination saved costs as well as provided health benefits. Now, when that occurs, that's considered an economically dominant intervention. In other words, it's a, it's a no-brainer to use it. It not only saves costs, but also provides health benefits. Most interventions, you have to pay something to gain the health benefits. And we're essentially trying to say, okay, we want to minimize that cost. And if it goes below a certain threshold, then the intervention is considered cost effective. But there are some situations where an intervention not only, not only provides health benefits, but also provides cost savings. So it's making you money as well as providing health benefits. And that's a, that's a slam dunk. That's a, that's a perfect situation because we're not even, it, there's no net outlay of costs, we're actually gaining money. So we found that with the Chagas disease vaccine, there are many situations where, where it can actually provide cost savings along with uh, health benefits. And we outline those different scenarios. Basically the vaccine has to be this efficacious, above this eff efficacy threshold, it has to be below this cost. And uh, we use this to provide or, or outline the target pro profile for, uh, for different groups who are currently developing the Chagas disease vaccine. So I want to acknowledge some of my uh, collaborators, uh, some key collaborators with this work with the Neglected Tropical Disease Vaccine Development. Uh, Peter Hotez, uh, who's a, a dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, Maria Botazzi, Dave Demert and Jeff Bethany, they've been invaluable with this work. So I wanted to move on to the next category, which is the delivery of medical goods. In this case, we're using an example vaccine delivery. So vaccines, of course, are, you know, have been one of the, uh, the, the biggest successes in, in public and global health. Uh, vaccines have had tremendous impact on, on reducing uh, the risk of disease and reducing the morbidity and mortality of disease. But one of the key components of vaccines or any type of medical intervention is they actually have to reach the population to be effective. So uh, our Hermes team, uh, Hermes uh, logistics team, has focused on uh, building models to help understand the distribution and delivery of different medical goods, in particular vaccines, but we've also moved to other types of medical goods. And this is our team. It's a multidisciplinary team, which includes uh, people from different backgrounds and different areas of expertise. So our co-coordinators are Diana Connor and Angela Wateska. Um, we, uh, we have experts in supply chain management um, and uh, industrial engineering. So Brian Norman and Jay Roskpool have worked with a number of different uh, companies of different industries, such as Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, UPS, uh, Walmart, and, and Target and they brought their expertise over the past four years to our team to, to help understand how a lot of the learnings from other industries might translate to vaccine uh, distribution and medical good distribution. Uh, Sean Brown is our technical lead. Uh, he's the Director of Public Health Applications at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, 
and he has a background in comput comput uh, computational sciences. Uh, Joel Welling is our lead developer. He was the first employee of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Yu Ting Wang is also a developer, as well as Jim Leonard. Uh, Aaron Claypool is a uh, industrial engineer, and then we've got many experts in, in public health modeling, such as uh, Leila Hadari, uh, Diana, and Angela, as I mentioned pr previously. So I want to emphasize that this is a true team effort, that uh, we have many uh, diverse individuals who are contributing to this work. So uh, through our efforts, we've developed uh, a software platform called uh, Hermes, uh, which stands for Highly Extensible Resource for Modeling uh, supply chains. The vision of Hermes is to create a freely available and user-friendly software tool for different types of decision makers, whether they're uh, manufacturers, intervention developers, uh, policy makers, or funders, to, um, to generate an interactive simulation model of any supply chain, which can serve as a virtual labor laboratory to help answer a number of different questions. Are all of you familiar with what a supply chain is? No? So a supply chain is the series of steps and processes and components and resources that it takes to get some type of good from one location to another. So for instance, if I want to get vaccines from the manufacturers uh, to uh, two different countries and within the countries from the central locations in that country to the population, it has to go through a series of steps. So it has to go through a complex network of uh, vehicles, personnel, stores locations, um, and other types of locations to eventually get to the people. So it's actually a, a quite complex um, effort that needs to be orchestrated and coordinated. So we, develop, uh, we use Hermes to develop detailed simulation models of all these steps and processes to answer questions such as, what's the impact of introducing new technologies, such as new vaccines, new storage devices, uh, new monitoring devices, what happens if you change the characteristics of all these different uh, technologies? What if you change the configuration operations of the supply chain? For instance, if you remove or add locations, uh, change the configuration or change, change the number of levels that the supply chain has? What's the effects of different conditions and circumstances, such as power outages or, or shipping delays? Where should you best invest or allocate resources? And how to optimize vaccine delivery? So, Hermes creates these discrete event simulation models, which are essentially these virtual representations. So if you think uh, Sim Earth or Sim City or Second Life or some of those computer programs, uh, this is essentially Sim supply chain. So we represent each of the refrigerators, freezers, personnel, vehicles, and storage facilities um, in great detail, virtual representations of these things. So just like uh, the real uh, versions of them, they all have different characteristics, such as a make and model, uh, a capacity, energy consumption, uh, unit costs. Uh, and each of the different vaccine vials is represented by computational entities. So we have millions of these virtual vaccine vials flowing through the system. And each vaccine vial has an antigen type, has a, a packet size, uh, temperature profile, things like that. The service delivery locations are represented similarly but they have some key differences. One is you have healthcare workers there who perform things such as open, open the vaccine vials, reconstitute the vaccines, and then administer it to arriving uh, clients. So these arriving clients are essentially uh, children or mothers who are, are scheduled to receive the vaccines. So they arrive just like virtual people. And if the vaccine is available and the healthcare worker is, is available, then they're successively uh, immunized. If they're not available, then they uh, are counted as missed immunization opportunities. And then all of these uh, things that are used or consumed go to medical waste, and all the vaccine doses that are not used go to open vial wastes. So we run these simulations, and we can pull any type of information from these simulations after they're run, just like virtual, again, just like a virtual laboratory. And we can test uh, different types of scenarios. So we've worked in a number of different countries, so we've developed uh, models of the uh, supply chains in Senegal, and this is not listed here, but, oh, here it is, Benin, uh, Niger. Uh, we're working on India, forgot the name there. Uh, we've developed uh, uh, models of Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, in particular, I want to point out that we've worked with a number of different collaborators um, for the Vietnam and Senegal model. We've worked with Project Optimize, which is also funded out of the 
uh, Gates Foundation, and they uh, constitute, um, consist of uh, the World Health Organization and PATH. And for this uh, Benin model, we've worked closely with AMP, which is based in, in um, Paris, as well as the uh, WHO. We've worked with UNICEF for a number of these different projects, and we're currently developing a model of uh, two states in India, Bihar and Kerala, and we're working closely with UNICEF, uh, the uh, Public Health Foundation of India in there, as well as Inklings. So a number of different collaborators that I uh, want to emphasize. And part of this, through part of this effort, we've been uh, uh, developing the EVM plus Hermes initiative, which is funded uh, from the Bill, uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The EVM is an effective vaccine management tool that was, that's been developed by the World Health Organization. It's oriented towards uh, quality assessment, so it evaluates the current vaccine management practices, compare it, comparing against best uh, practice scenarios. And then our uh, Hermes tool is, as I mentioned, uh, can explore operations, simulate additions, and help optimize the operations and structures of the supply chain. So we're combining these along with other tools to create a suite of tools that any country or organization can use to evaluate, diagnose, and help improve a vaccine supply chain. Um, so our test country, our initial test country was Benin, and our, 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 our second pilot country is India for this. And I wanted to quickly run through some examples of, of studies that we've done. Each of these studies uh, originated from decision maker questions, many times in country. So for instance, the Niger Ministry of Health was interested in determining what's the impact of introducing pneumococcal rotavirus vaccines into their routine um, WHO EPI uh, immunization program. And we essentially found that if you introduce these vac new vaccines, it, it substantially exacerbates existing bottlenecks within this, the supply chain. So they're currently transport and storage bottlenecks with, throughout the Niger supply chain. Uh, may, these are overcome in part through coping. So many of these, uh, many of the locations and, and uh, personnel there will try to do things to, to cope to get the vaccines to the people. So they'll, they'll use uh, less st standard measures to actually get uh, the vaccines to their locations. But once you introduce these new vaccines, the coping gets overwhelmed, and you essentially substantially in, uh, uh, exacerbate these bottlenecks so that all the vaccines, and not just the pneumococcal and rotavirus vaccines, can't get to the population. And this is highly dependent on the size of the vaccine. So if you introduce much larger presentations of these vaccines, the bottlenecks get a lot worse. So we also did, uh, we also done studies such as looking at the impact of changing the presentation of different vaccines. So the Thai Ministry of Health was interested in switching the 10 dose measles vaccine uh, with a single dose presentation, actually a single dose MMR. So we simulated that change and we found that the, the Thai supply chain actually has um, considerable capacity to accommodate this change and that this change can actually benefit um, Thailand by reducing the amount of open vial wastage that occurs. The, um, by open vial wastage, I mean the number of uh, doses that are not used. Uh, similarly, the, the Thai Ministry of Health was interested in, in introducing the flu vaccine through their standard routine supply chain and wanted to determine the effects of that. And we found that the, if the impact of introducing the flu vaccine is highly dependent on what percentage of the population gets the flu vaccine. So if you want to vaccinate everyone versus certain high risk groups and how quickly you want to vaccinate everyone. So we found if you want to try to target the entire population and you want to try to vaccinate everyone within one or two months, the supply chain actually gets overwhelmed. So there are certain transport levels that don't have enough capacity to handle this rapid introduction to the flu vaccine. Now, if you space it out over a number of months and if you reduce the target population to high risk, um, individuals, then the, the supply chain can handle it. So essentially, the decision has to be made of whether you want to limit who gets the flu vaccine or whether you want to augment the supply chain so that, that uh, you can target the entire population. We've also looked at the impact of making different types of vaccines thermostable, and this is of, of great interest to a number of different funders as well as a number of different vaccine developers. And essentially, we looked at uh, the Niger vaccine supply chain and what happens if you make different vaccines, such as pentavalent or uh, measles vaccine thermostable, so that you can actually pull it out of the cold chain, uh, leave these vaccines outside of refrigerators and freezers, 
uh, for different periods of time so you can potentially alleviate the burden that's on refrigeration and freezers. So we found that this, this can actually help reduce these bottlenecks that exist in countries such as Niger. And we've also looked at the impact of doing things such as uh, adding storage or adding transport vehicles to different types of supply chains. We found that one has to be uh, careful about adding st storage um, devices as the refrigerators and freezers. Um, for instance, if you were to add, just add refrigerators and freezers to the Niger supply chain, you actually can worsen transport bottlenecks because you are uh, creating more storage, but if you don't uh, improve the transport at the same time, you can actually have the transport get clogged up because you have enough, if, enough uh, refrigerator space to, to hold these vaccines, but you don't have enough uh, transport vehicles to take these vaccines down to the next level. And this is important because many times, historically, the solution has been to just send more refrigerators or freezers to a country if, if the thought is that there's not enough um, capacity to, to, uh, in the supply chain. But we want to emphasize that the supply chain is actually a dynamic, complex system. And we found many historical examples of these refrigerators and freezers being sent to these countries. And essentially, they sit in warehouses or they're not used. Um, so one of the benefits of doing modeling prior to making decisions such as those is you can actually determine, well, what's the optimal solution? And, and how do we actually solve the, uh, the vaccine distribution problems? So that's vaccine delivery. Uh, so now I wanted to move on to uh, an example of vaccine administration. So uh, we, for, for, um, for, for vaccine administration, this is an example of a study that was published in Health Affairs, where we essentially used a domestic model. So this is a model of uh, the DC metropolitan region. So this includes uh, a number of different counties in, in Washington, DC, Maryland, uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, we created this virtual representation of uh, the DC metro area. So we took uh, U.S. Census data, and we created uh, this agent-based model, which includes virtual representations of each person within the United States, and then we created virtual representations of all the different locations, such as households, um, employment locations, schools, and we assigned each of these agents to each of these locations, and then we created this virtual United States from which we can extract uh, different uh, subregions within the United States. So for instance, DC metro region or virtual Pennsylvania or virtual California, what have you. And this again is, is similar to the Sim City or Sim Earth, where we have uh, these individuals uh, throughout the day uh, traveling between their households uh, and schools and work locations or different community locations such as malls and interacting with each other. And we can simulate the spread of infectious diseases and the uh, application of different types of interventions. So in this study, we, uh, we asked the question, if you have a limited number of vaccines, so say flu vaccines during an epidemic, um, who should get those vaccines first? And this arose from our work in 2009 during the H1N1 pandemic. So during the H1N1 pandemic, I myself and one of my colleagues, uh, Sean Brown, were embedded in the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Specifically, we were in the office of the ASPR, which stands for the Assistant Secretary of Public Health Preparedness and Response. I believe that's the, um, the acronym. Um, and we were using computer modeling to help with the national response to the H1N1 pandemic. So they would ask us questions such as, uh, what's the impact of vaccines being delivered in a certain schedule? Uh, what's the impact of, of using antivirals in different populations and different situations? Um, what, uh, what's the impact of closing schools? What's the impact of, um, uh, on the uh, different healthcare facilities in terms of search capacity? You know, do, are there enough uh, ventilators? Is there enough room for, for patients? Should, should uh, different influenza scenarios uh, carry out in different ways? And one of the questions uh, that emerged was, where should vaccines go to first? Because as, as you probably recall, during 2009, the vaccines, uh, there were a limited number of vaccines early on. So the vaccines didn't come out until later in the fall of 2009. So we ran different types of uh, experiments in which we, uh, we compared 
a situation where no vaccines were available, and then a situation where the vaccines went to the lowest income counties and the highest income counties or equally distributed. Um, and we had different scenarios in which only 200,000 doses were available, 400,000 doses were available, or 700,000 doses were available. Our findings were that you actually have the, um, the greatest savings and the greatest uh, benefits if you give the vaccines, deliver the vaccines to the lowest income counties first. Um, and can anyone guess why that might be the case? Any thoughts behind that? I'm sorry? Living and working in mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So that's one of the key components. Uh, so uh, lower income counties or locations tend to be more densely populated. So individuals, there's heavy mixing uh, with, among those individuals. Any other reason or thoughts? <clears throat> so another key component is that there's a lot of traveling that occurs between uh, lower income uh, locations and higher income locations. So many people have to travel great distances to go to work. So essentially lower income locations uh, can serve as generators or many times cauldrons of epidemics. So you have heavy mixing, you have a lot of people who are mixing quite heavily so they can transmit amongst each other. And then they also travel extensively so they can transmit um, uh, the flu or any type of other types of infectious diseases to other parts of um, the region. Um, the same is not true with higher income uh, locations or higher income counties, which tend to be more sparsely populated and people don't travel as much. So we found that it's benefi uh, beneficial uh, to society and as well as businesses and many other components of society uh, to give the vaccines to uh, lower income locations first. And it's actually maybe beneficial to higher income locations because essentially you're cutting down overall transmission. So this slide essentially shows what happens if you delay vaccination to the two poorest, uh, poorest counties. So these are different types of delays. Uh, this is no delay, this is 10 day delay, 20 delay, and 30 day delay. This is the number of new influenza cases over time. These, this is days on this horizontal axis. So you can see that if you delay vaccination to the two poorest countries, you have a substantial effect on the number of cases that occur. So you can actually impede, um, impede the mitigation of the epidemic by delaying uh, to the uh, two lowest counties. We don't see as great an effect if you delay uh, delivery of the vaccine to middle income counties or higher income counties. So the conclusion from this study was that people are highly interconnected in the system, not isolated islands. So many times, one of the, one of the issues in public health is that different segments uh, within society uh, believe that they're isolated islands, that what happens in another location or another population won't affect them. But this is indeed, as, as many of you know, is not true. So there is substantial benefit to actually protecting all communities, in particular communities where there are higher risk for disease um, uh, outcomes or disease transmission. So as I mentioned, poor communities are important. And this is an example of, of um, a self, seemingly selfless altruistic behavior can actually lead to selfish utilitarian benefits. So many times in public health, we try to argue that, well, it's good to do this intervention because this is for the good of society. This would be helpful. And whereas that may ring true with many people, many times people have utilitarian um, concerns. So they need to, you know, they're concerned about uh, first protecting their interests. And, many, and if we demonstrate situations where you can actually, it's actually beneficial to people's quote unquote selfish interests to have, uh, to implement a, a public a program or intervention that's beneficial to public health, uh, this is sort of a win-win situation. So finally, I wanted to go through a, an example of a, a non-vaccine, um, uh, some non-vaccine that work that we've been doing and that will be familiar to some, some of the folks in the audience. So this is our REA team. Um, REA stands for Regional Healthcare, Ecos Health, uh, Care Ecosystem Analyst, which is a software program which can rapidly generate uh, models of health systems or a number of different healthcare facilities. 
Uh, this is our core team, although our core team has been growing. We have other individuals that are not uh, on the slide, but I uh, wanted to point out uh, Talos Avery, who's uh, based in Harvard. She's, she does a lot of um, uh, the analytical, analytical work with the data to transform data into a format that can be uh, uh, re readily used for modeling. Sarah Bars has been very key. She's a, a research coordinator of my group, but she's been um, helping coordinate a lot of our activities. Um, Diana Kim, who's over Diane Kim, who's over there at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, my key collaborator, uh, Susan Wong, uh, who's also based here at UC Irvine. And uh, I also wanted to point out Kim Wong because he's been key in, in developing uh, Raya. But everyone within the team has, has contributed substantially to this effort. So this is an example of um, a study that emerged from uh, this modeling effort. As I mentioned, we've been developing, we essentially developed a virtual Orange County. So we've, we've uh, taken all the facilities, all the inpatient facilities, the acute care facilities, which are roughly a little over 30, I think it's 30 or 33 facilities, and about 71 or so nursing homes, and this uh, in, in uh, Orange County. And we have these virtual representations. So again, Rhea can uh, rapidly create a model of the healthcare facilities in any region. In any region. And it can serve as a virtual laboratory to better understand different types of um, the spread of different types of infectious diseases and their uh, control measures. And so we have these virtual representation of each healthcare facility. So for instance, we might have a hospital that has uh, uh, multiple intensive care units and multiple general wards. And we have these virtual patients that go from the community and get admitted to each of these different facilities. They can go to a, an ICU or go to a general ward, and within each of these facilities, they can mix and interact with each other. And some of these are some of these individuals are positive for uh, MRSA and can transmit MRSA to uh, other individuals uh, through this close contact. So we can basically simulate the spread of MRSA within a healthcare facility and also between healthcare facilities because these individuals can move from hospital to hospital. So then we can also simulate the application of different types of interventions. So in this case, we, we simulate the implementation of surveillance and contact isolation. And by surveillance, we mean, say someone enters the healthcare facility, whether a nursing home or, or a hospital, they get tested for MRSA, or methicillin resistant staph aureus. And if they're positive, then they get isolated. If they're negative, uh, they're left to mix with um, other individuals within their ward or intensive care unit. And by isolate, I mean we don't put them in a bubble, but we essentially uh, have these contact isolation uh, precautions where anyone who's going to interact with patients who put on uh, gloves and a gown uh, so that they don't um, take the, uh, the, the pathogen or MRSA and then transmit it to, to another patient that they work with. Now these Intervention, such as the, um, the surveillance or testing, as well as the contact isolation, are not 100% effective. So there's a sensitivity and specificity, so you can have false negatives. So people who are colonized but are not isolated and remain uh, actively infectious and can transmit the pathogen to other individuals. And we also have false positive, where people are isolated, but they really don't need to be isolated. And then the isolation procedures also have an, an efficacy and compliance. So it's a not 100% not efficacious. So if you use isolation procedures, there's still a chance of you transmitting MRSA. So this study, which was published in Health Affairs, looked at implementing these interventions, the, con the surveillance and contact isolation, in different combinations of healthcare facilities. So for instance, this table shows, um, and I actually believe that this table has so we can switch to this one. So this, this graph shows what happens if you, uh, if you implement this intervention in different uh, healthcare facilities. So you start with the, the uh, highest capacity hospital first. Uh, this is the two highest capacity hospital, three highest all the way to the 11 highest capacity hospitals. This, this y-axis is the uh, countywide MRSA cases averted per year. And then each of these different lines are the interventions in different levels of 
uh, compliance. So 25% compliance, 50% compliance, and 75% compliance. So there is a synergistic additive effect as you implement these interventions in more and more different hospitals. Uh, so what this previous table shows is comparing, implementing this intervention in just this hospital alone versus the five highest capacity hospitals versus 10 highest capacity hospitals versus all hospitals. So we found, the, the, the punchline behind this, this, um, this study is we found that there are synergistic effects. So for instance, if you yourself are a hospital and you implement these interventions, you can have a certain, certain gains. You can reduce the number of cases that occur within your hospital. But there's a limit to that. That limit can actually be overcome if other hospitals are, doing the, are implementing this measure as well. So in other words, working together, you can have great, much greater gains than just working alone and not having cooperation. So we found, and there's actually situations where if you're not doing any type of intervention, but other hospitals are, you benefit as well. Because again, the hospitals are connected by patient sharing. So you, uh, a patient gets discharged from another hospital, if that patient's MRSA positive and gets, discharged, uh, gets admitted to your hospital, you suffer the effects of that other hospital not controlling or preventing MRSA and vice versa. So our general conclusions are that extensive patient sharing can spread MRSA among facilities, that MRSA control should account for this patient sharing, and that cooperation among facilities can attain synergies in MRSA control. And this is just an example of how REA can serve as a virtual laboratory for healthcare systems or healthcare facilities. And you know, we've, we've used M uh, Orange County as the initial test county, but this can be applicable to other counties as well. And, uh, Hopefully I've captured everything that we've talked about. You know, feel free to add uh, anything that, we've, that I've missed. But so in general, uh, those are just some examples of some of the work that we've been doing in modeling and simulation. So in conclusion, modeling simulation can serve as this virtual laboratory to test uh, interventions before they're applied, help shape interventions, uh, or help uh, answer a number of different questions that decision makers may have, and we work with a variety of different decision makers, ranging from funders to manufacturers to policymakers to uh, ministries of health um, uh, to uh, other other types of um, uh, disease control officials. It's widely used in, in many other industries. So, so, so my personal feeling is that the public health and, and medicine could substantially benefit from this uh, this work. It can save considerable time, effort, and resources, and it can serve as a complement, again, not as a replacement uh, for other types of studies. So hopefully that's been useful, and I'd be happy to open up the questions and, and uh, go back to any of these examples or provide more examples if, if useful as well. Thank you. So Question over there? Yes, I enjoyed the presentation. Mm -hmm. I, was, um, I, I think uh, you kind of elegantly laid out the potential benefits of your Thank you. I, I want to think of um, though some some forecasts where complexity isn't always better. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think the benefit is that when we see all these, I mean, we can kind of intuitively say the more information we have, the better we'll be able to kind of predict what's going to happen if we have this intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, small area population forecasting is one example where sometimes more complex models aren't don't work out nearly as much because there's yes. uncertainty about say migration rates. Exactly. And um, that annoys faculty because we mm -hmm. get trained highly to be highly specialized and introduce more complexity mm -hmm. that doesn't isn't always needed compared to like linear regression, you know, drawing two lines to a line between two dots. Yes. So my my question is, um, given the simulations that you run, mm -hmm. um, have uh, different um, constituents implemented it, and then tested what or examined essentially whether or not um, your the precision that you use or the, the point estimates that you give mm -hmm. um, adhere with what they find, mm -hmm. um, either in terms of you know stimulating more research on the uncertainty or just kind of whether or not it actually got even close. Because I, I mean, it yes. sounds great, but just mm -hmm. wondering what, what the pragmatic uh, evaluation has been. So, so excellent question uh, on multiple levels, because you actually pointed out certain uh, key, uh, key elements or key uh, concepts that, that I'd like to emphasize. So one is that uh, the, the, the issue of parsimony when, when, when modeling. So many times there's a tendency, as you mentioned, to make 
models overly complex. And uh, we want to, tr instead we want to try to model to the level of the question. So we want to try to, we don't want to make a model that's more complex than one that can answer the question. So for instance, if you have a situation where you are trying to decide, should I go to the store or not? Uh, so you usually make those decisions on, based on some you know, limited factors. Okay, am I hungry? Do I have money? You know, is it 4 a.m. versus 10 p.m. or what have you? Um, but you don't think about, well, you know, what's happening in the other half of the world? Or you know, what is a certain Hollywood star doing? You know, in theory, those things could affect your decision to go to the store. So if, for instance, I'm going to just toss out a name, Justin Bieber was doing something today that somehow trickled down to affect whether you, know, you are going to be able to find something in the store, that's going to affect your decision. But you build a model, you're not going to include it there because it's, it adds unnecessary complexity. Similarly with these models, we want to try to keep them as simple as possible, uh, but we, add, we slowly add layer complexity when we realize that the simple model can't answer the question. So, so some of these models are fairly complex simply because they're addressing some complex issues. But you don't want to take some of these complex models and address something which can be answered by a more straightforward decision model or a compartment model or what have you. So we do all types of modeling. I'm just giving some more complex examples. So that's the first point. So thank you for raising that. The second point is the uh, point of validation or the issue of validation. So validation essentially is determining whether your model is representing what it's supposed to represent. Um, and validation is not an either or thing, or it's not binary. Like, you know, a model can never be fully validated. Um, instead, validation is assembling evidence or assembling an argument that your model is actually representing what it's supposed to represent. So of course, the, 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 the simplest or more basic validation is, is face validity. You know, does this model make sense? Is, does it seem like it's representing what it's supposed to represent? But then beyond that, we do different types of validation, and we're constantly doing validation. So we try to compare it with retrospective data. We, we try to determine if the model can reproduce what has already occurred or what is occurring, or predict what may occur, and then see if it actually compares. Um, so I can give an example with, with our supply chain modeling. We've run workshops in places such as Senegal and Vietnam, and we've tried to simulate things that have already occurred and see if it yields the same results. Or we've asked, we've had these situations where we were working with uh, folks from the uh, Ministry of Health or the uh, EPI program and say, okay, what do you think would happen if we did this? If we, for instance, introduced new vaccines, which, which locations will have the greatest problems? Or what will happen to these refrigerators and freezers? And then they've made their predictions and then we've run the models to see if it's compared. Um, so we've done different types of validation um, or continuing validation. Uh, the validation I mentioned uh, just now is more criterion validation, where you take a certain either gold standard or existing situation and see if the model can re reproduce that. Um, it, it's not always 100%, so there, there can be differences between what the model predicts and what actually happens, so we try to determine what's the differences. And if the difference is great enough, then we have to go back and say, well, maybe we're missing something. So each of these are in um, sort of in, within that range. Um, you know, they, 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 they tend to, you know, we found that they, they tend to match up reasonably well, not 100%, but reasonably well. And like you said, there are situations where we find we'll run the model and it has, it has a certain amount of complexity and we say, well, this is not necessary and we'll peel that complexity away. So there's two reasons for putting, putting something or some type of parameter or characteristic into a model. One is because we actually think it's gonna have an effect and two is to prove that it doesn't have an effect. So uh, many times when people will see a model, they're like, oh, you, you aren't putting this into the model, or this, this isn't included. So we'll put that into the model just to show it, it doesn't really have an effect. But excellent question. Yeah. Question? Um, yeah, I have a question. So mm -hmm. in your lecture, um, you were saying that implementing vaccine treatments to low-income communities um, and also pricing vaccines um, seen through modeling can be better for the economy and public health. Mm -hmm. um, but what does this mean for pharmaceutical companies and um, neoliberal ideologies and forces that make treatments cost prohibitive, um, which in turn exclude low-income communities um, in terms of public health and ethics? And mm -hmm. can modeling be good to address public health issues ethically, but also mm -hmm. can it be used for, um, I guess, bad, like money-making or very human deception? 
Mm -hmm. so, so if I understand your question, I mean, one, one uh, to address one of your points, there, there are many situations where we can identify win-win situations in public health that, we, that people didn't really realize were win-win situations. Um, so, you know, so one example is, is, is um, many manufacturers have been re reluctant uh, to move into uh, markets that are, have lower profit margins or no profit margins in some cases. But, um, they, but they found that there are situations where they can actually move into those markets and provide for those markets and it can be beneficial for everyone. Um, it's not as if the, you know, many, we've worked with, uh, we've interacted with many manufacturers and, and many, in many cases, you know, they, they uh, these companies will have many well-meaning people, but they have other constraints. They have other things that they have to work towards, you know, so, so uh, manufacturers have to keep an eye on their quarterly profits and their stock prices, et cetera. But you can develop a model to help identify a situation where they can, that aspect can potentially benefit. So the, the, the profit and loss statement can benefit and they're actually providing public health benefit as well. Now I think your second question was, can models be used for more, um, uh, what's the word, uh, devious reasons or et cetera? Certainly any, any, any methodology can be used. A model, uh, a study method, any type of study methodology, clinical trials, retrospective studies, et cetera, they're all like, they can be weapons in the right, uh, wrong hands and they can be beneficials in, in the right hands. So the key is not to accept modeling um, as, a, uh, as a, just a general tool for everything. Um, similarly, you don't, want to do you don't want to accept all clinical trials and you don't want to use a clinical trial for every single question. But the key is to become a more discriminating um, uh, evaluator or critic of modeling. In other words, uh, if you understand how modeling can be applied and how it should be used and how it should not be used, then you can better determine, well, okay, this, this is an appropriate model, this is an inappropriate model, or this, uh, this is a good situation where a model can be used and vice versa. So I, I, th I think that's important, important to keep in mind. Um, we've run into situations where modeling is either uh, universally accepted or universally rejected. So someone will see a model and they'll have a bad experience with it, so then they'll say, okay, I don't want, I don't want to deal with models ever again. Or situations where they, they've had a good experience with model, they're like, great, bring it on. Let's, 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 make, let's accept models of all kinds, et cetera. Either approach is wrong. So you essentially want to be able to understand what model, even if you're not a modeler, understand what it can do and how to assess and evaluate a model. Does that answer your, your question? There will be more questions. You are invited to ask them at lunch over at EMB again. Um, thank you very much on behalf of our faculty and students, just a little token. Oh, and, thank you. And thank you, Kat. So please join me. Thank you.